silicon quality and the so-called silicon lottery are often discussed in the industry, but it's rare for anyone to have enough sample size to actually demonstrate what those phrases mean in practice, aside from, well, maybe silicon lottery, the website. We asked Gigabyte to loan us as many of a single model of video card as they could so that we could demonstrate the frequency variance card to card at stock, the variations in overclocking headroom, and actual gaming performance differences from one stock card to the next. This helps to more definitively strike out the question of how much silicon quality can impact the GPU's performance, particularly, again, when at stock, and also looks at memory overclocking and range of FPS in gaming benchmarks with a highly controlled bench and a ton of test passes per device. Finally, we can see the theory of how much one reviewer's GPU might vary from another's or from your own when running initial review testing. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly's Conductonaut Liquid Metal. Conductonaut is what we've used in all of our liquid metal and D-Lid thermal tests, capable of dropping CPU thermal significantly when replacing the stock thermal interface. Lower CPU thermals don't just allow better overclocks, but also lower noise levels because the transfer efficiency is increased. The mix of gallium and indium makes for a thermal conductivity of 73 watts per meter Kelvin, outclassing traditional pastes significantly. Learn more at the link in the description below. So this was a pretty exciting video to work on because it's not common that you can get so many of one device at once. We borrowed these to make that clear. So Gigabyte has loaned these to us for this research because uh, this is not, to our knowledge, not something that's been done for GPUs at any a meaningful scale. And seven is, it's not as many as we wanted, but it's as many as we could get. Still pretty good sample size though. And what we're gonna look at is things like average frequency out of the box without any overclocking and see where does that cap, cap out? Because card to card, each one will have a bit of a different VF or volt frequency curve. And that's determined by largely by silicon quality. And then from there, we can look at overclocking headroom and the actual impact on gaming performance. So where this has been done a lot for CPUs and looking at CPU overclocking frequency headroom, this is, uh, at least to our knowledge, one of the first opportunities to see this for GPUs in a third party environment. So pretty fun stuff. The topic idea actually arose from two things. It, one of them was sort of silly. It was a comment on one of our Xbox benchmarks ages ago where they, it, it was a console player who hadn't really seen our content know, or knew who we were and said that we only had a sample size of one so the tests were invalid, which is, I mean, it's just, that's not really how it works with the console. Uh, but the thought arose of, well, okay, so with GPUs, if you have a sample size of one, how reasonably can you draw a conclusion of a stock card? Just ignoring the overclocking side of it. That's a bit more variable. Uh, so we're looking at that partly and then uh, investigating some of the overclocking headroom and largely debunking some of the concerns about, again, uh, sample size of one not being enough for a stock conclusion or even an overclocked one. So anyway, uh, testing methods, pretty concrete here. We'll define them more in the article below, but this is our previous test bench from before the super launch, not that it really matters much, it's the same bench either way, and uh, using the older games, we did more test passes than typically, so we typically do a minimum of four. Here in some of the tests we did up to 15, like with uh, some of the 3D Mark testing we did. We also had a minimum duration of 30 minutes for each of the frequency tests to allow the cards to, uh, to soak and heat up and reach a target temperature level. And then we also, for overclocking, we raised all the fan speeds to 100%. We got the cards to about the same temperature, uh, plus or minus one degree Celsius or so, and overclocked it until it reached instability. And then we ensured that the overclock would hold for a couple of hours, for about four hours or so uh, through an overnight test or during the day test. So it's more strict than our review guidelines where we just, we need it to hold for the duration of the review. Uh, so it's a bit stricter in that regard, and that gives us a, a more realistic look at what a user might sustain for an overclock rather than something you just need for testing. And further, we've gotten the standard deviation here run to run in most of these games down to about 0.1 FPS average. The 0.1% lows, which are always the most variable, are in most cases down to about 1.1 FPS average uh, in the 0.1% deviation. So there's still some margin of error here baked in, of course, there always is run to run variance, but a lot of the time, and we'll talk about this more as we get into the numbers, the variance is less than one FPS, uh, like over an average of the benchmark. So we'll see numbers like 113.58 to 113.77.
for example, for a range of, of results across multiple passes. Uh, also, you'll see the last few digits of the serial number in some of the charts. That was just for us to internally identify which card is which when we were doing the testing. So let's get into it. We'll start with some of the frequency stuff. That'll be the most interesting. We'll have some game benchmarks at stock, so you can see the differences. If uh, I guess the, ex the idea here is if you buy one or if you're watching multiple reviewers' videos, assuming none of us get a card that's just straight defective, which happened here, by the way, we have one, uh, then how much range can you expect from one card to the next stock? So let's get started. Doing an overtime frequency chart with this many GPUs would be impossible to read, as you can see in this quick example, because GPU boost on NVIDIA cards means that there's almost never a flat line. It happens, but it's rare. It's typically tied to an unlocked BIOS and a very cool GPU, like in the 40s to 60s degrees Celsius, uh, typically close to the 40s. For the most part, each card will fluctuate based upon thermal, power, and voltage limiters, and so we end up with this mess when we plot so many devices. Instead, we're resorting to a simpler bar chart with averages across 1,500 cells of an identical load scenario. We get a much more readable format with this chart. The out-of-the-box performance establishes a stock frequency range of about 45 megahertz from top to bottom. We control the ambient temperature and other variables, so this comes down to actual silicon quality and variants of the GPU itself. For each GPU, a volt frequency table is generated that is used to establish the frequency stepping under NVIDIA's boost parameters. It'll run at very slightly different voltages and frequencies, and clocks can't dial in down to, say, 1 MHz, so you typically see a range of about 10 to 12 MHz steps. The best GPUs on this list, in terms of the out-of-the-box stock frequencies, are GPUs 4, 5, and 1. The worst is GPU 2, although we'll later show that GPU 3 is actually defective, making it the one that's really the worst, something you'll see in the game benchmarks, but not in the frequency testing. So this is a matter where they all technically have the same spec on the side of the box or on the website. Uh, so they're all hitting the boost spec, the base spec, but this is additional boosting headroom based upon, again, thermal power and voltage, and then silicon quality being the one we're looking at today. Note that the best stock GPU doesn't mean the best overclocker, and the best overclocker on air doesn't mean the best overclocker on liquid nitrogen, as Kingpin of EVGA has told us in the past. The next chart shows the maximum overclock for each card, beginning to establish the start of the silicon lottery demonstration. The maximum stable GPU frequency was on GPU 5, running at an impressive 2072 MHz for the 1070 Ti. The next best was GPU 4 at 2048 MHz, then GPU 7 at 2019 MHz. Note that GPU 1 has a higher stock frequency than GPU 7, but GPU 7 has a higher overclocked frequency. Also note that this is the stable frequency after a few hours of burn-in, so it's an aggressive bin, rather than a bin we would do just for a review duration. GPU 3 has some serious issues, but they're deeper than the frequency you're seeing here. GPU 1 would be disappointing in the face of GPU 5, as 70 MHz is actually beginning to be significant for benchmark performance. Perceptually, in terms of gameplay, you won't notice much, if anything, between the two, but it would show up in the charts. Finally, for maximum memory overclocking, we ended up stuck around the same 600 MHz offset for each set of VRAM. GPUs 1, 2, and 3 hit 2304 MHz, with GPUs 5 and 6 getting a bit higher, landing at 2352 MHz for those. GPU 4 managed 2400 MHz impressively, and GPU 7 got stuck at a measly 2194 MHz, a definitive worst. And a few notes here too, you'd have to multiply this by 4 to get the effective speed, that might be the number you're more used to. We're showing the actual speeds, and separately, these are the frequencies after we did validation to make sure they weren't tanking the 0.1% low performance with memory errors that you don't see by just looking at if it's quote unquote stable in time spy, for example. So these are also longer burn in numbers. The frequency range tells most of the story so far for this comparison, but games will help illustrate the rest. Knowing now that our stronger performers in the chart are GPUs 4 and 5 and sometimes 1 in terms of average frequency over time, we can see if any of those differences correlate with meaningful benefits that exceed test variation for the stock performance. And note again, these are from our old GPU test bench results as they were tested before RTX Super or Navi came in, so you're not looking at the newest data, but it's just for the 1070 Ti's that we're testing on mass today, so it doesn't really matter. For GTA 5 at 1080p, we measured the average results to be within a range of 1.3 FPS 
of each other uh, once subtracting out the single outlier. GPU number three is an RMA unit, and it seems there's a good reason that it was an RMA unit. Someone actually had a problem with this one. It looks like this one has a defect in the GPU, despite being comparable in clock speed. We retested this one three full times and came up with the same results every time. Stripping the outlier, the FPS range is close enough that it's within test error. As for whether the better performing GPU is correlated with the higher FPS, GPUs 1, 4, and 5, especially 4 and 5, had the highest stock clock speeds, and these GPUs also ended up with the highest frame rate in this game. The data consistency here is excellent to see, and our test-to-test -test variance has low standard deviations, so accuracy is good. Even the 0.1% lows are within test error and standard deviation. With about five test passes per GPU per resolution for these cards, we can see that there's slight deviation from card to card based on those earlier clock speeds, but it doesn't amount to much when stock. At 1440p, the stack remains very similar. GPU 5 and 4 tie for first, differentiated only by error margins and 1% lows. And GPU 1 follows these, with GPU 6 next on the list. Our top three performers for clock speed remain the top three for stock FPS, predictably, and GPU 3 is again shown to be a defective outlier. Our standard deviation is 0.1 FPS average across 35 test passes, 0.5 FPS average for 1% lows, 1.05 FPS uh, for the 0.1% lows for standard deviation, and then we ran these tests at a minimum of two resolutions, sometimes 4K, depending on the game. For F1 2018 at 1080p, our results range is 2.7 FPS average, with standard deviation at about 0.3 FPS for the average, 1.6 FPS for 1% lows, and 0.6 FPS for 0.1% lows. Performance at lands GPUs 4 and 5, again at the top, with the next three all roughly tied. 1% and 0.1% lows are all within test variation, with only GPU 3 standing as an outlier, but at least it's consistent. The top to bottom range here is 2.6% improvement from GPU 1 to GPU 4, and with an average FPS deviation of 0.1 FPS, that's dead on for each card. 2.6% isn't a huge deal from a consumer standpoint, but it can be a big issue for reviewers, especially if you test one card for your initial review and maybe you change it to a different one for a later revisit. It could mess up the data if you're trying to compare new data versus old data because the stock frequency could be different enough that there's a bit of a percentage change baked in there that might be all you would see from a driver change anyway. So if you're trying to test drivers and using two different GPUs, test it across maybe a couple months apart, the differences from those uh, factors alone could be enough to uh, overwhelm the difference from a driver change, for example. So same reason it's best to control GPU speed as best as you can for tests where it needs to be fixed. So that's something to pay attention to. For reference, GPU 1 scored between 113.4 and 113.8 FPS average in all tests, extremely consistent. GPU 4 scored 116.56 to 116.77 in all tests, also very consistent, and that's the same for just about all of these. GPU 3, again, being the uh, outlier because it's defective. Additionally, GPU 1 was one of the better three overclockers in 3 Mark, but that performance doesn't necessarily carry one-to-one -to, -one to every type of workload, as you can see here. At 1440p, the test results for F1 2018 show a range of 2.7 FPS average, or a maximum percent increase from bottom to top of 3%. Consistently, GPUs 4 and 5 are at the top of the list, although GPU 1 remains lower than we might have expected based on the previous results. Far Cry 5 at 1080p is next. For this one, our range is 105.6 to 107.8 FPS average, ignoring the obviously broken outlier. Bottom to the top, that's an increase of 2%, or a range of roughly 2 FPS average. Results are all consistent still for GPUs 4 and 5, which are tied and within even the smaller error of this test. They're actually almost identical, and GPUs 6 and 2 are within our standard error for these tests as well. 1440p shows almost the same stack, except GPUs 7 and 1 trade places, and GPUs 4 and 5 trade places this time. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is the last actual game we'll look at for this. At 1080p, the range of performance is 1.8 FPS average total, with GPUs 4 and 5 remaining consistent in placement throughout all of these tests. We can see that there's at least some direct real-world correlation to the higher average clock speed in the 3D Mark test earlier, but it's not enough of one that you'd ever really notice without a large sample size and a highly controlled set of tests. 
you might start to notice for overclocking, as we showed earlier, where the range is closer to something like 70 megahertz in some of the GPU to GPU comparisons. The only difference on this chart that a user might actually observe would be the defective GPU, like unit number three. The rest are all within average test variants in less controlled environments than our own, especially. At the end of the day, against our sample size here, it wouldn't much matter one card to the next as long as you don't get a total limit, like GPU number three, which clearly has a defect and shows good reason for its RMA. Even if reviewers got golden samples, so to speak, which we have more evidence contrary to than in support of, uh, minimally the stock performance would be with an error of what anyone else would get, and overclocking performance has some range, of course, but that's not news to anyone. What is interesting is seeing the range illustrated on the same model card where we scale from 2072 megahertz at the high end all the way down to 1954 megahertz, which is a massive range. And again, same exact model on these, not just the GPU, but the video card itself. The SKU is identical. So 100 megahertz and overclocking headroom can have an impact on frame rate and definitely on benchmark scores. But if you fall within the mean, say closer to 2030 megahertz here, it'd be hard to differentiate any actual perceptual differences versus the top end clock, even though if you're benchmarking competitively, some this terrible competitive benchmark frequency, but if you were doing it, you would see the differences there. It's just uh, in game, you would never realize those as a human player. The memory overclock with the 1070 Ti's also spanned about 300 megahertz range, although this will behave differently with GDDR6 and HBM2 clearly. So with regard to whether gold samples exist, we already knew that answer. The answer is yes. Silicon just works that way. Some pins better than others, and that's all there is to it. Uh, the further question of to what extent do they exist? We have a better insight on their, their silicon from this generation that overclocks much higher than these as a further example, but this gives you an idea of the range. And also things like the cane pin card or the lightning cards wouldn't exist if they couldn't push the higher frequencies on those natively. So now we can illustrate to what degree the clocks change even when stock, which is important for reviewers because if you're a reviewer and you want to run uh, multiple video cards for a non-GPU test bench, then it's important to control that variable too, because the stock-to-stock -stock range here, uh, if you're looking at uh, 45 megahertz or so, will definitely start to chip away at some of the percentage differences in the scores, and, and that matters. You could have up to a 2% impact just from changing between these cards, not even counting some of the others where we've seen up to 5%. So that'll mostly wrap it. Uh, this isn't really a, a discussion on review samples, although that is an interesting aspect of it. It's more meant to look at the consumer higher uh, sample size, although not as much as we want, but still pretty damn good, a higher sample size of cards of uh, what's the range. And as far as the review samples go, well, uh, we can tell you that at least for the most recent two launches from both AMD and NVIDIA, AMD sent out for Radeon 7, they sent out the uh, chips that were more in the like sort of the 50 percentile, so not great overclockers. They were actually some of the worst overclockers, which is something AMD straight up told us. And that was not because they were trying to send one way or the other, it's because it was early silicon. Uh, NVIDIA for the super launch didn't check the cards either. And we know that because some people got dead cards in the mail. So they weren't even necessarily turned on, although that much is normally done. So anyway, that's it for this one. Uh, pretty cool information. If you want to see us do more of this type of content with a higher sample size of stuff, let us know what the thing is and if you have some ideas of what you'd like us to look at because we can probably talk to the manufacturers and, and get a, a loaned amount of that device um, and, and send it back eventually, but it'd be enough to do the tests. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.cameransnexus.net to support us directly like by buying one of our mod mats or our new toolkits, which are in stock. And you can also go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.